So here we are as we sit and discuss this. It's one week from the season, but the season is right next door to us, and there's so many conversations to be had. So it's great to have you and Damar Smith, the executive director of the NFL Players Association, with us. Commissioner, uh, I'm going to start with you. Uh, the, the connection for so many NFL fans to the issues of social justice have roots in Colin Kaepernick in the 2016 anthem protest. What for you has been the change in how you view what happened four years ago as we sit here now? Well, I think, you know, all of us went through a process of learning and trying to understand what our players were protesting, Colin and uh, Eric Reed and uh, Kenny Stills and so many other players that um, we're really trying to bring attention to what's going on in their communities and our communities. And we're seeing that play out now on screens in front of us, and it's been going on for decades, if not longer. And it, for, for us, it was just understanding what their focus was. And then also, beyond just the attention that wanted to be brought to it, how do we help and support them make the change in their communities that we so badly need? And it's clear, and I think everyone is seeing that now. And, and I think everyone is at a position now saying, OK, we need to do more. And let's do more and make the change that is necessary, which we all know has to happen. D. Collins' name comes up a lot. I I'm just curious, in your role as the head of the Players Association, have you spoken with Colin recently? Does he want to play in the NFL? Because that's the question a lot of us get all the time. Does he want to still play? Yeah, well, the, the last time I spoke to Colin, um, uh, he was definitely interested in, in playing, um, obviously. The union supported him not only during his his um, um, his case against the National Football League, but we actually sent someone down to his tryout uh, in order to make sure that that it was going to proceed um, in a in a good and fair and a balanced way. Um, I would love to see him in the National Football League. I know there's tons of fans who would love to see him um, in the National Football League, but you know where Colin sits right now. Um, in, in, in America is whether he is playing football or not, um, he started a conversation on a national level, mm -hmm. um, and Roger and I are continuing that conversation today. And Roger, if one of your owners called and said, you know what, I'm thinking of bringing him in. I want to bring Colin Kaepernick in. What advice would you give one of the owners? Well, they usually don't ask me about who they're going to sign. Uh, that, it starts with that. But, you know, that conversation has happened many times, and I've encouraged them to do that. Um, you know, we had a, D mentioned it a moment ago, we had a tryout uh, where 26 clubs came to, to watch him try out mm -hmm. uh, last year. And so that was the kind of effort to sort of say, listen, if you want to resume your career, here's the opportunity. And, you know, um, those are decisions that each individual owner has to make and their club, their coaches, their general manager. And I've talked to a lot of our clubs about it. And so I've encouraged them and I'd love to see him play again. Let's turn our attention to the field. When we turn on our TVs and watch the NFL on Thursdays and Sundays and Mondays, how are we going to see the conversation of social justice that has been so prevalent in America presented on the field in terms of the NFL and its players? Well, I think, you know, first it's going to start with the fact that, uh, you know, we're, we're working with our players and we're working with our clubs to be able to do that in a way that reflects and the union to, to reflect I think we're, we all feel are the important issues of today. Um, you're going to see it on the field, actually in the end zones, with end racism on one end zone, and it takes all of us in the other end zone. We're going to see it on the back of their helmets. A lot of our players have chosen to wear victims of police brutality and uh, their work to support those families. D uh, and I and our, obviously our constituency owners and the players just yesterday announced that we were going to provide scholarships for the families of those victims as part of this effort. So I, I think you're going to see it in a very emotional way mm -hmm. um, uh, as part of the opening of our season in a way that I think it's important to do. And, and it will be balanced and we'll focus on football. D, how important is this for the players? Well, it's incredibly important um, to the players. Um, you know, for, for where we sit, we know that we have tremendous fans who love our game. Um, I've always said that, that I love the players more. Uh, but this effort between ourselves and the National Football League is, is about two things. One, um, promoting and supporting our players and their voice, um, but also 
embracing this idea that that while football is great and we all love the game, um, I would never want to be in a world where the game is simply a distraction from what's going on in our communities, in our towns, across America. Um, you know, Postman always talked about you know America entertaining itself to death. Um, it is a great thing that we are taking this issue, um, this problem, uh, this historical problem, and and we're not divorcing it from football. Um, we're making it a part of what it uh, means to be a fan, a player, um, an owner, um, and and for people in sports. What does all of this mean to us at this moment um, in America in time? And I think that's important. Roger, what does it mean to you to be a part of this right now? I think this country, I mean, having grown up in Washington, D.C. in the 60s um, and lived through a lot of this right in my own neighborhood, um, this is a really important moment for our country um, to address issues that need to be addressed and to fix them, to, to make the sustainable change. And when you say live through it, your dad being a U.S. senator, during the 60s, the civil rights movement, really in D.C., there was a direct visual on the streets on a regular basis as Absolutely. you're coming home from school. No, I, I, I went to a public school, an elementary school, and walked home, and, the, you know, uh, there were people who were protesting. There were also riots, and there, were, there was a lot of unrest. Um, and, I, and I think things, good things came out of that right. uh, in a positive way, but not enough. And I, and I think what I hope now is that this country is in a position now to make really sustainable changes now and, and ones that will lead to respect for everyone, equality, opportunity for people to end racism and to be able to give people the opportunity they all deserve and that respect. And that's what I hope we're going to get to. And that's what I think is so important is it, it's not just the protests here. It's really how do we move beyond that to the point of really making the change in our communities and the change in our world that we really need to have. We saw a week or so ago NBA, WNBA, Major League Soccer, Major League mm -hmm. Baseball, uh, National Hockey League, games come to a stop. Players using their power and their platform to protest and just not play. That could very well happen with NFL players. What, what's your position and view on what we saw a couple of weeks ago in sports? Well, Mike, it really started with the Detroit Lions, who decided not to practice that day and spent time reflecting on where they were and, and putting priorities. As Dee mentioned, the priorities of, of playing football or basketball or baseball, uh, it was a time when, you know, everyone was hurting. There was frustration, anger. Um, and I think that was a really good pause for people. Um, and so, you know, I, I was proud. Our teams did that on their own level. Several um, teams did. Several teams. Mm -hmm. And that was, a, I think, an important thing for people to do. But, I, you know, Dee and I spent a lot of time talking to both owners and players over the last several days and really talking about, okay, so what change is going to come from this? Mm -hmm. What are we going to do in our communities to make sure that we are impacting the change that we really want to impact and doing things that are going to lead to that? And, Dee, I'm thinking of the Texans, the Ravens. Uh, they put out some specific things, some specific points and plans. How closely are they working with ownership in this regard? And is this a template for other teams and franchises to perhaps follow? You know, Mike, I think the best thing that we're seeing here is that those conversations are organic. They're, they're happening among players. They're happening with players and coaches. They're happening with players, coaches, and management. Um, and those are things that flow directly from the player's belief that protest is not only important, protest is inherently American. Um, you know, Roger's father was a part of a march on Washington uh, against the Vietnam War, where, where he marched with Coretta Scott King, my father, was a part of the March on Washington um, in, in 1963, before I was born. Uh, that was a protest for um, fairness, equality uh, in America. So I, I look at what both of our dads did and see a seamless um, line between that and what our players are doing today. And to me, um, the, the, the beauty of it is that all of it is in response to what's going on in our communities. 
And no one believes that this is an opportunity that they can simply check out and mm. just play football or check out and just play basketball or check out and enjoy sports as entertainment. Um, I think all of us believe that this is a time where we can enjoy something, but enjoy something with the recognition that we're not divorced from our community. D, we know that the power happens when people are paying attention. How do you anticipate the players using their platform when we get to game days and weekends this fall? I, you know, I, I think that they will not only, um, I think Roger used the word emotional. Um, I, I think that's what I would expect because that's been a part of the conversations that we've had. I, I think it will be powerful. I think the fact that our men, um, you know, at a time when a lot of people would, would characterize uh, professional athletes as being somehow separated or in their own bubble about what's going on in the community, I think you're going to see our players embrace what's happening um, in their community. Uh, but more importantly, I, I really believe that this idea that somehow, you know, we can just forget what's going on in our community for three or four hours of a sport or forget what's going on in our community because we can flip on the television and be entertained away from what's happening. Mm -hmm. Our players, our fans, our coaches, our owners are all making a decision that we are not going to let ourselves be used in a way to take the spotlight off of what's happening in our community. And that's an important time in America where um, there are some public officials who wish that we would just simply play football or play basketball and get away from what's really happening in our communities. That brings up a conversation, and it can be small houses or it can be the biggest houses in our country. There are some folks who say, leave the game alone. I don't want politics mixed in with my sports when I sit down to watch the National Football League. What do you tell those people? Well, Mike, you know, we, we don't impact the game per se, but, well, but we have to understand this game is played by human beings, people who are coming from these communities who are impacted by it uh, emotionally. Um, they're frustrated. They're angered by this. Their families are impacted by this. And, you know, these are our communities. These, we live in these communities. We play in these communities. We operate in these communities. And I, I think we're all tired and uh, see the, the things that are going on that are abuses that shouldn't be happening. And, you know, it's a time for us to, to make the change. And I think, you know, sports has been a big part of social change through the years. Mm -hmm. You can go all the way back into the 30s. It was the Olympics in 36. That's right. <laughs> with Jesse Owens. Jesse you, Owens. Can, you can go back into the 68 Olympics. Uh, John Carlos and Tommy Smith in Mexico correct. City. And, you know, you can talk about all these changes. Jackie Robinson, you can talk about so many things that have happened to help our country get to a better place. And sports has been a big, big influence on that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're not here to make political statements. We're, we're here to help make our communities better. I, I want to ask about you for a second, because you want this to be about the players and their platform and their role. But I, I've watched over the last few years, your impressions of this entire situation have evolved and changed. And I know that you've gone on ride-alongs with the police. You've sat in bail hearings. You've tried to educate yourself. Listen, which is what we all talk about now. We need to listen better. Can you share something that you found in that discovery process that has helped you evolve into how you're viewing this from your leadership role? You know, when you... By the way, I didn't just educate myself. I was educated by our players. Honestly, they, they were the ones who invited me to go on the ride-alongs in Miami. Like who? Was, and, well, and give me some names police. of some of the players. Kenny Stills, as uh -huh. an example, we were riding along in a police car, talking to a police officer. We went into communities to talk about the relationship between the police with the police. And did that help you get it, understand? Absolutely, because uh -huh. I, I think when you hear it, you see it, you feel it. Right. And I felt it, and I can feel the emotion from our players and the fear that they have consistently living with. And I think from that standpoint, when you, when you hear that and you see it and you feel it, you know, it, it makes you say, this is wrong. And, and, you know, if you weren't aware of it before, you better be now and you, you should really be part of the solution. And, you know, 
we need to do more. The NFL needs to do more. Roger Goodell needs to do more. D. Smith needs to do more. And I think we're all committed to doing that. And, and you know, our players are out there, and we're not only going to support them, we're going to, we're going to be there with them. D., your players have taken a pretty strong role here, a lot larger voice than maybe five or ten years ago in terms of numbers of players. How have you seen the players' willingness to put themselves out there and be – prone to criticism, candidly, by those who think they should just shut up and play. How have you seen that evolve with this current generation of player? Yeah, and Mike, great question. I, I think it's been um, a growth, a recognition of identity, um, and, it, and it being okay, acceptable, um, necessary to, to identify um, who you are as a man, for me, identifying myself as a black man um, in America, identifying um, with with our history, with um, who we are and, and where um, we find ourselves in America. I, I think players um, have done a great job of embracing that identity and understanding um, that they should not be uh, relegated to a two-dimensional athlete, somebody that um, somebody can turn off when, when the game is over, somebody that uh, they can stop seeing when their, their ticket to the game is, is no longer valid. I think you're finding players really embracing their identity and the way in which Muhammad Ali embraced his identity and the way in which Billie Jean King embraced uh, her identity, Christine Brennan embracing her identity. All of these things occurred in sports in a way where all of those individuals, and, and Roger mentioned many of them as well, decided that I'm not simply going to be defined by what I am doing in the, in the field or on the field or in the pitch or in the locker room. Um, and, and to me, it's that embracing of, of the three-dimensional person. And, and does that subject some of them to criticism from fans who mm -hmm. just – don't want to be bothered. Um, I get it. And I've had those conversations with my friends, and they are my friends, um, about why um, is this a part of football? Um, and my answer to them is simple. It's a part of life. And, and we are a better country when we decide that we are not going to put blinders on or live in a silo. Um, embracing what it means to, to have this game played by people mm -hmm. Um, who are husbands, sons, um, fathers. Um, that's what it means to be a part of America. And, and I think that that's when America is at its best, when we recognize the things that we have in common and recognize the history and the things that, um, that, that we have to fix in order to be a better um, citizen. You know, uh, Mike, just uh, to follow on D a little bit, uh, you know, we've spent the better part of a year negotiating over our labor agreement. Right. And uh, a lot of that time, there were players in the room. There were owners in the room. And, you know, we talk an awful lot about it uh, offline about uh, how extraordinary these young men are. Uh, they are so smart and so intelligent and have such an important perspective and have really helped us get to a labor agreement that is far better than it would have been without them. And so their input to making the NFL better is really very clear. Um, and I think the same's true here, because not only were they able to, to give us a better understanding of what's going on in their communities, but they were actually able to work with us to help identify solutions. So what we announced last week about what the union and the, the NFL was going to do, were going to do together, mm -hmm. you know, really reflects their input. It reflects what's important to them. When, uh, you know, George Floyd was tragically killed, I talked to hundreds of players. Uh, several players called directly. Patrick Mahomes called. And the, the one thing that they really focused on that was really interesting was the importance of voting and the importance. And Dee and I talked about it early on. That's how we exercise our rights as Americans. That's how we affect change mm -hmm. at some point. And so... We have put together a campaign, you know, that is about NFL votes, and we launched it six or seven weeks ago. It's having, I think, a real impact internally in the NFL family, and we hope externally with helping people register, get educated, and most importantly, get out and vote ultimately. And that's how we exercise our rights as Americans. And those things came from the players, 
Mm -hmm. And those things are being executed with the players as well as the clubs. And that, that, to me, I think is incredibly powerful when you see that. Because we always talk about football. You know, when you're in that locker room, they don't care whether you're black or white. They work together. They work together for a common goal. There's respect. And they achieve something bigger than themselves individually. And, uh, you know, that's on the field. But off the field, these guys go and make difference in their communities that is absolutely extraordinary. And I have such respect for our players for that reason. You mentioned the collective bargaining agreement and players and owners being in the room and helping to make this happen. There have been a few owners who have been very vocal in this social justice space and the need to address it. How important is it to get more or all of the owners to publicly be out there and lead this conversation in those communities like their players? I would bet you in every league meeting we've had over the last year, there's been some discussion about either social justice or our diversity and inclusion plans, and how do we get better in making our organizations more diverse? Are you getting buy-in from the owners? Absolutely. You know, obviously, you're going to have some clubs who do things better than others, and, and some teams that may do it differently. Uh, but that's okay if it's organic and it's with the players. But those conversations that Dee was talking about where owners and players are sitting in the same room talking. I, I had one owner who called me the other day who said they spent four and a half hours in there, just the owner and the players. Hmm. And good things come from that. There's a better understanding, and there's, um, I think, a, a chance to, to, to bridge differences in a, in a way that ultimately is going to make us all better. We've seen the NBA in a bubble. We've seen the NBA players talking very candidly about the social justice issues. We've also seen them be honest about the toll <laughs> it's taking on them and mm -hmm. their mental health, in addition to the playing sure. and all the other stuff. Where are the league's uh, attention and focus, where is it right now, regarding the mental health of the players, which if we watch across the street, the NBA, that's impacting that rank and file right now? Well, mental health is, is uh, obviously something that Dee and I have spent in our collective bargaining agreement addresses in ways that it never did before um, to give more resources to our players. To, to look at mental health the same way we look at their physical health. We give them the best medical care in the world. We want to make sure their mental health is there. And, and this, these last several months have been really challenging for all of us. And if you're in a bubble, it's more, even more difficult. Um, and so I think that's, you know, one, it's support. Two, it's getting medical expertise. And, and three, it's education. What do we do? But I also think part of it's getting out and making a difference and supporting that. And I, I believe that's helping all of us a little bit because I think we're frustrated by the fact that things aren't changing fast enough. Mm. How do we get out and make that change? I think that's, that, that's what defines us as Americans. It's in the Declaration of Independence, right? If, if you have the ability, it is your obligation to go and make change. And I think that's what our players feel. That's what our clubs feel. I know Dee and I feel that way. And I think that's what the NFL is doing. I want to wrap up with this, guys. The NFL has spent uh, $250 million plus here in an investment over the next decade to social justice causes and those things. That's a 10-year window. If we're sitting here before the start of the 2021 season next year, what does success look like in this space, social justice in the National Football League? I'll start with you, and then, Dee, you can add on. Well, real change. Uh, I think the, you know, where we've really identified the changes in uh, several areas, economic advancement, an opportunity for people of color, particularly, um, to education, which is, again, helping in education, uh, in criminal justice reform, and trying to do that. That doesn't happen overnight, but that needs to happen. And in policing and helping with police and community relations and making sure that it's done in a way we all support the police, but we don't support bad policing. And so what are we going to do to try to help and bridge that gap and get to a better place? Uh, so changes in those areas are, I think, where our players are really focused, where our clubs are really focused. And it's going to be different from community to community. We're not, you know, that commitment is really... The, the issues that may be in Cincinnati may be different than what's in New York. And, you know, the players in the clubs and the owners coming together to identify those issues and address them collectively is the, the type of, um, I think, change we want to see happen. Dee, what will success look to you 
What will it look like to you when we're sitting here next yeah, year? I, yeah, Mike, I, I think success would look to me um, would be how well have we continued to build on institutions, policies, programs, uh, voices for change. Um, you know, Michael Brown uh, was was killed on the streets. Um, St. Louis players at the time came out of the tunnel with their hands up. Um, that was several years ago. And, and we're now sort of in the same, many would argue, in the same place. So success to me will look um, a lot like how well have we built upon where we are today. Um, it, it might be um, um, a world where there's a bye week um, for players, for everybody during the season at the same time for social justice and community service. It, it might be more of our institutions um, talking with each other and creating opportunities for change. You know, Mike, we're a labor union. We don't make any apologies for um, aggressively representing our players. And certainly in the past, uh, we've had our dust-ups with, <laughs> with the National Football League, to say the least. Um, but we have built um, structures. We have built procedures. We've built policies um, since then that truly have um, made us all better. So to me, Mike, um, a, a lot of success will look like how well have we built upon where we are today um, on the cusp of the 2020 season. Incredible times. And we'll uh, continue to watch the next chapters as they play out. Damaris Smith, Roger Goodell, thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Appreciate it.